Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on Sit and Tango by Krasna Horkai Lashlo. Uh, this was Krasna Horkai's first novel and it really inaugurates the sequence of books he would write across the next 30 years. Melancholy Resistance, War and War, Baron van Kheim Chalai, books that are exploring life in Hungary, usually rural Hungary, provincial towns, uh, but books that are examining life from a very particular point of view. Krasna Horkai has a very pessimistic point of view in these novels. He wants to examine what is it that makes our lives worth living? Is it a level of agency, even when we're poor? Uh, is it that we have some independence, some agency, some freedom to make choices? Is it rather the relationships that we form with others? Even though those relationships can be broken, uh, there can be infidelity, we might fall in love with someone or have a romantic uh, interaction with someone who we know is, is, is not necessarily only finding that connection with us, but is finding it with other people. What is it that is important? Is it our purpose? Is it being part of some community, some higher purpose that, that, that lends itself uh, to, to justify that what we may be missing by saying, hey, at least I know where I'm going. I have this target I'm going towards. And so Krasna Horkai really examines all of those ideas. And then at the end, he seems to go and, and having subverted each of them in turn, he goes and subverts the entire novel in another way, in a way that I don't wanna uh, spoil for those who haven't read it. But it is a good book to read. And it's a very useful book to read for anyone who's interested in reading his more, his more recent works, because he introduces all of these themes uh, and, and he then explores and amplifies them in very different ways across his subsequent novels that, that this sort of lays the foundation. But let's get into the book itself. We start off in a small hamlet of a rural area in Hungary. And we have a character who wakes up. One morning near the end of October, not long before the first drops of the mercilessly long autumn rains began to fall on the cracked and saline soil on the western side of the estate, later the stinking yellow sea of mud would render footpaths impossible and put the town too beyond reach. Futaki woke to hear bells. The closest possible source was a lonely chapel about four kilometers southwest on the old Hockmeis estate. But not only did that have no bell, but the tower had collapsed during the war, and at that distance, it was too far to hear anything. And in any case, they did not sound distant to him, these ringing, booming bells. Their triumphal clangor was swept along by the wind and seemed to come from somewhere close by. It's as if they were coming from the mill. He propped himself on his elbows on the pillow so as to look out of the mouse hole sized kitchen window that was partly misted up and directed his gaze to the faint blue dawn sky, but the field was still and silent, bathed only in the now ever fainter bell sound, and the only light to be seen was the one glimmering in the doctor's window, whose house was set well apart from the others on the far side, and that was only because its occupant had for years been unable to sleep in the dark. Futaki held his breath because he wanted to know where the noise came from. He couldn't afford to lose a single stray note of the rapidly flang fading clangor, however remote. You must be asleep, Futaki. Despite his lameness, he was well known for his light tread, and he hobbled across the ice-cold stone floor of the kitchen, soundless as a cat. Opened the windows and leaned out. Is no one awake? Can't people hear? Is there nobody else around? A sharp, damp gust hit him straight in the face, so he had to close his eyes for a moment, and apart from the cock crow, a distant bark, and the fierce howling of the wind that had sprung up just a few minutes earlier, there was nothing to hear, however hard he listened, but the dull beating of his own heart, as if the whole thing had been merely a kind of game or ghostly half-dream. It's as if somebody out there wants to scare me. Uh, he thinks through the seasons. He thinks of uh, remnants of a locust plague summer and suddenly saw on the twig of an acacia as in a vision the progress of spring, summer, fall, and winter as if the whole of time were a frivolous interlude in much greater spaces of eternity, a brilliant conjuring trick to produce something apparently orderly out of chaos to establish a vantage point from which chance might begin to look like necessity. And he saw himself nailed to the cross of his own cradle and coffin, painfully trying to tear his body away, only eventually to deliver himself utterly naked, without identifying marks, stripped down to essentials, into the care of the people whose duty it was to wash the corpses. People obeying an order snapped out in the dry air, against a background loud with torturers and flayers of skin, where he was obliged to regard the human condition without a trace of pity, without a single possibility of any way back to life because by then he would know for certain that all his life he'd been playing with cheaters who had marked the cards and who would, in the end, strip him even of his last means of defense, of that hope of someday finding his way back home. And those are the first two pages of the book. That is a sense of what you're going to spend time with if you embark on the, on a journey with Krasner Horkai. He is relentless. Um, from, the, from the off, he is suggesting that there is a very uh, pessimistic way to view this world, that there is a lack of our agency, agency that even when we 
think we're making choices. The, the choices have, have already been made for us. We're presented with a very limited number of options that all lead to the same result. Uh, he goes on to now expand from Futaki into the, this hamlet. We meet a couple of different um, uh, couples and some different in, in individuals who seem to have had this, this existence that from the beginning just seems miserable. Uh, it's cold. The roads are muddy. They, they don't seem to have cars that work. They use like wagons and carts drawn by, by livestock uh, at one point. And later on there, there is a, a truck that they have, but it's this open, uh, open truck that like everybody's just freezing cold in as it rains and they're driving through and the rain is just pelting them. And even the rain doesn't seem to wash anything away and cleanse. It rather seems to produce mud, not just on the ground, but as if there's so much dirt and residue in the air that when it rains, it's raining mud on them. Uh, it's dirty rain. And so that there's this sense that nothing cleans in this book, everything just becomes grimier and more broken. Uh, they Part of the action takes place at this sort of tavern bar that one character has purchased. And he keeps thinking through the fact that he thought he was getting a good deal here, but the place always has spiders. And is there some way he could, you know, get, get maybe, you know, sell the spiders or somehow get somebody else to buy it without them finding out about the spiders. And that the spiders seem to be the only thing that live in this place that, that they inhabit. And so we're presented with characters who, who seem to have this very miserable existence. And as the novel progresses, things change. They're, you know, they leave this place, they go off to another estate uh, where they, they think that everything's gonna be green there. That that's gonna be where, where they have their purpose. They're gonna have this community that works and they'll have jobs that are more fulfilling. And yet in surrendering the, the, the limited agency they have that Krauss and Horkai has mocked from the beginning uh, to, to join this community, to, to become part of this you know, group, um, is that somehow going to uh, shift and, 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 and you know, now their lives are even worse? despite the fact that they seem to be at the lowest possible level they could, have they somehow even less agency and, and less happiness in their lives? And so Krauss and Horkai is just, he pulls no punches in this book. Um, but from there, from the beginning, he then shifts over and we see these characters who are seemingly in like a prison or in some type of institution. And it's it's obscure. It's hard to, uh, to necessarily figure out what's happening. We're not necessarily told you know, from the beginning, one day in mid-October when it was raining, Futaki woke up. That's about the clearest sense of, of, you know, setting we have across most of the book. Most of the time, you have to pay attention as a reader and we have to figure out, okay, where is this? Who is this now who's talking? Uh, is this the same time period? Is this before or after the previous chapter? Um, and so that, that it's, it's a, a very focused, gnomic type of writing, but that's very purposeful because we're then introduced to Irimiyash. And Irimiyash is uh, very much the, the Satan whose tango the characters are participating in, or so it seems. The spiders that are in that bar are, of course, weaving their webs, but Irimiyash seems to be weaving his own web uh, and just entrapping all these different characters. And we see that the way that they, they sort of all have their knives out for each other, and then Irimiyash brings them all together. He brings them into this purpose. He's sort of introduced at the beginning. We don't know what's going on with him. Maybe he's been dead. Has he been resurrected? No one's seen him for a year and a half. Uh, but gradually, he takes on this Mephistophelian purpose. But there are ways in which he seems to almost represent not just this demon, but rather a, a strong man, written at, towards in the final decade of the communist um, rule of Hungary. The book, in some ways, uses Irimiash as this strong man. Of course, there's a present strong man in Hungary with Orban now. Uh, and so Baron Benkheim's holiday sort of returns to that idea. But here in, in Satan Tango, we have Irimiyash, and he, he has the language of someone who is who's putting everyone under his spell, the cult of personality, this charisma. And so I wanted to share a section of the way he speaks. What has fate done to you, my unfortunate friends? I could be referring to our friend Futaki here, with his endless depressing talk of flaking plaster, strict roofs, crumbling walls and corroded bricks, the sour taste of defeat haunting everything he says. Why waste time on small material details? Why not talk instead of the failure of imagination and the narrowing of perspective of the ragged clothes you stand in? Should we not be discussing your utter inability to do anything at all? Please don't be surprised if I use harsher terms than usual, but I am inclined to speak my mind now, to be honest with you. Because, believe me, pussyfooting and treading carefully around your sensitivities will only make things worse. And if you really think 
as the headmaster told me yesterday, dropping his voice, that the estate is cursed. Then why don't you gather your courage in both hands and do something about it? This low, cowardly, shallow way of thinking can have serious consequences, friends. If you don't mind my saying so, your helplessness is culpable, your cowardice culpable, culpable, ladies and gentlemen, because, and mark this well, it is not only other people one can ruin, but oneself. And that is a graver fault, my friends. And indeed, if you think about it carefully, you will see that every sin we commit against ourselves is an act of self-humiliation. And he goes and, and, and proceeds to bamboozle the entire group into giving up all of their possessions and under his spell. And he's going to take them off to this new, this other estate that's not cursed, that is going to you know, be a place where they can all work and they can be friends. And those who want to spend time with their spouses can do that. And those who want to spend time with someone who is not their spouse can do that. Uh, and then and he's going to allow them to embrace all of these things and that the, the way that they have debased themselves in this miserable, you know, uh, cursed estate is rather going to now be, he's going to lift them up out of that together. And so the what takes place the next day is almost this uh, uh, orgy where they go and destroy what's left of these tattered curtains, these broken down, you know, spider webbed, uh, cobwebbed cabinets. Uh, and they wreck many of their positions and pack up what's left and they all head off together. And that seems to, to raise this question of like, whoa, you know, as desperate as their lives were, is it better now? Is it better to have given everything over to this, this man who very probably is a con artist, who does not seem to have their best interests at heart? The, the little glimpses we have into the mindset of Irimiash suggest that he's a very venal and, and, and corrupt individual uh, who's simply going to just take everything and, and, you know, we're worried he's just going to make off, make off with it. And he returns. But the, the life he leads them to is certainly not a, a promised land. Uh, he, he forms the community. He then shatters the community that itself is always just held at best by a couple of spider, th you know, threads of spider webs. Uh, but then at the ending, everything is subverted. Everything we seem to have uh, been going through is subverted. It's important that there are 12 chapters in the book. There are six in the first part and six in the second part. And it very much represents the 12 steps of a tango, six steps forward, six steps back. But notice if we're going forward and back, we end up where we started. And while the characters don't end up in the same location that they started at, so I say chapter 10, when they've gone off to these different uh, locales uh, around this part of Hungary, there is a sense that perhaps that their their lives have not changed in, in any remarkable form, or if they have, they've perhaps become you know just as bad in, in different ways. Um, and then Krasnohorkai begins to show and reveal this sort of formal technique in which he is he taking adopting a metafictional attitude. And the introduction of Irimiash through the second chapter and then through this long magnificent speech that that. Uh, is is how he's introduced in the middle of the book when he reconnects with all of the individuals there in the bar. Um, do do seem to take on this metafictional uh, uh, sense. There's this way in which this long, almost 16, 20 page speech is, is a monologue of sorts that he just pours out. The questions around, is he like this resurrected man, but rather than being you know, a, a resurrected savior like Jesus Christ. He's ra almost this rather like resurrected antichrist uh, who, who is far more dangerous. Um, all of those questions are raised, but where Krasno Horkai ends the book is fascinating. As I said, I don't want to spoil it, uh, but it's very critical. It's very important. And it, it does ultimately reveal the full depth of that six step forward, six step back tango. So it's a book that I would recommend uh, to readers who are interested in in sort of uh, the mindset Krasno Horkai is going to, to present, the questions he's going to raise, whether you agree with them as a reader or don't. I would disagree with Krasno Horkai, but I've lived a very different life from him. And so to to spend time with these characters and to see what their lives are like and, and how they could be brought to these choices is very interesting. Um, and then ultimately to see the ways in which uh, the, the security state of communist Hungary had existed and the way in which that, you know, limited... Uh, options, even for the most charismatic of indiv individuals, is interesting. Um, but as I said, it's it's well worth visiting. Now, Krasno Horkai has written other works, as I mentioned. Melancholy of Resistance was uh, a later book. And this is, I, I would say, the strongest of his books that I've read. I'm hoping to read Baron Benkheim's Holiday um, this year or next year. 
But Melancholy of Resistance is probably the strongest of his novels. It takes many of the ideas from Satan Tango and then it pushes them out in different ways. I think one of the great features of Satan Tango is the way in which the, the chapters are really these like single paragraphs. They're not broken up. And there's a sense that Crouch and Horkai is taking um, individual speakers and he's saying that each of them perhaps doesn't really have the voice that they think they possess. That there's not, the, when we break up a, a book into paragraphs, particularly with dialogue, that you know a new person speaking means a new paragraph, it gives this individual value to that voice. It says, okay, this is a new paragraph. This is someone else's voice speaking within the novel or story. Yes, it comes from a mind or a couple of minds who are behind the, the writing of the book. But this is an individual voice for this character. And Krasna Horkai, by compressing all of those voices into a single paragraph uh, that just runs for 16 to 30 pages, and all of the narrative is packed in there, all of the dialogue, they're not even given line breaks. The, someone's speaking, someone else is speaking. Krasna Horkai seems to be pushing at this idea that the individual agency that, that we think the characters are losing midway through the novel it's not something they ever possess, that their voices just crowd into this chorus that is the chaos that on that first and second page, Futaki was thinking of that, you know, that there's this order that's drawn out of the chaos. It's conjured order. It's manufactured order. The chaos is still there. The, the fabric of their existence is chaos. The fabric of this book is chaos. And so each of the characters is, is contained within that. They don't have the singular individual voices they thought they possessed or, or that we as readers are used to characters possessing. Of course, all of that might be, you know, questioned in the final pages of the book, but Melancholy Resistance very much takes those ideas from Satan Tango. It advances them and amplifies them. It, we, we again, we have the circus comes to town instead of a, a an antichrist, uh, Satan, but the the questions the themes are so relevant they're so pervasive uh and i i, I just there's a i think the ironies within melancholy resistance are a bit more fleshed out and developed in in really interesting ways i think there there's a clear first book second book growth that occurs between the two more recently um and sort of the book that put cross and horkai on my radar was baron Finkheim's holiday and the way that this was getting a lot of praise around the the translations um i believe all the translations have been from uh, the same translator, uh, George, George uh, Zirtis. But looking forward to reading this. Certainly there's an element in the monologue paragraphs uh, that Thomas Bernhardt has. I would say Gargoyles feels the closest, the way that the landscape out at the Prince's Estate in Gargoyles is sort of this hell on earth, the way that the doctor and the son are traveling around at the beginning of Gargoyles and just everybody seems to be dying. There's no, there's no real hope. Uh, in, in this book, as there are not necessarily in the novels of Krasna Horkai. Certainly a work like Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy comes to mind, just the almost nihilistic uh, tone that it takes on, along with, um, I think the writing that Blood Meridian, uh, that McCarthy reaches in Blood Meridian, he's later in his career, the writing is perhaps a little bit stronger, but the themes are, are just as thoroughly uh, presented, the, the provocative questions around our choice, free will, uh, hope are all there. Uh, a very contemporary novel to Satan Tango would have been The Door by Jabo Magda. Jabo Magda. Um, and here, this is more autobiographical. Uh, she, she's revealing a very different side of life in Hungary, um, but it, it's very much the same Hungary. And the formal, the formal inventiveness here, the way that it, the, the narrator, you know, the, one of the main characters is named Magda, uh, does seem to take on a tone that is, is uh, formally inventive in very different ways from what Krasna Horkai has done across his career. A much earlier Hungarian writer would be uh, Krudi Zsula with Sunflower. This is set um, sort of at the, the beginning, the, the beginning third of the 20th century, and shows Hungary at, at the end of the First World War as there's a Hungarian revolution. Um, Austria-Hungary has disintegrated and now there's going to be this new, uh, new state um, that the Hungarians have been seeking to get for hundreds of years. Um, so th this is one that I'm hoping to visit uh, this summer. I would say that there's a clear contrast between the writing of Milan Kundera and uh, Krasna Horkai. I think uh, Kundera and Laughable Loves presents so many similar like relationship interactions, the way that no one is, is in a like healthy monogamous relationship at all. Uh, and, and just how toxic love can seem, 
But uh, Kundera has a very different tone. He's much more playful. He's much more ironic. Um, even in a, a book like The Joke, which seems very, uh, is, is very specifically about like a repressive regime and someone who has been imprisoned for the titular joke and now wants revenge for it, uh, is not nearly as bleak as what Krasna Horkai explores. I would say Time Zero by Martin Amos might be another work that is both formally inventive uh, and is also just depicting a real horror within the 20th, 20th century. Um, something like A Dream Book for Our Time by Taduszka Kanonki. This involves Poland and sort of this individual who is almost a Rip Van Winkle fallen asleep and then as he wakes up he, he s finds himself uh, having slept through so many horrors in Poland including of course the horrors of um, the Holocaust, he, he, and then the Soviet takeover of, of, of Poland as a puppet state, he, he starts to think through, um, like, am I somehow complicit in these? And, and what would be my purpose? What is my agency if, if I suddenly was presented with all of these? Um, now, I, I think other works that certainly come to mind, certainly the, the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, the sort of presence of a satanic character there in the, in the title of the work, uh, suggests the the whole question that Bulgakov uh, raised of what would happen if you know the the devil showed up, and what havoc could you know be be wrought upon the society. Uh, there are clear comparisons, I think, to Samuel Beckett, um, particularly with uh, Malloy, the way that the characters sort of leave and and just have to travel through hell. Um, but also in Malloy's bike ride, but also with Malone dies and the way that we have sort of the narrators. Um, view of the stories that the narrator is telling and the way that the characters are sort of recalling things. Uh, another key text would be The Iceman Cometh by Eugene O'Neill here. I think we have, you know, Hickey shows up at the bar and everybody sort of wants to like listen to him. He bamboozles all of them. And the, the, the final act is very different between Long Day's Journey into Night and St. Tango, but I think it's a very comparable sort of theme that is raised and explored. Another one would be Under the Volcano, uh, certainly with the, the darkness, the dark tone, but also with that specific like nature to in Under the Volcano, it's broken into the 12 chapters that sort of are the hours of this single day. And here we have these steps forward and then these retra retracing uh, moments. And then finally, The Parallel Stories by Nadash Peter, um, who, this is this massive, more than a thousand pages, uh, ex examining all sorts of facets of uh, Hungarian society, Central European society, just numerous characters, the way that he is pushing forward in all sorts of different ways. I think Quentin over at Idget Reads and Rambles might be reading this soon, so... We'll see if I join in on that. Um, but thank you for joining. Let me know if you've read any of Krasno Horkai's works. If there's one that you really enjoy, I still think Melancholy Resistance is my favorite. But Satan Tango is a very good place to start because it, it introduces so many of the ideas he's going to do. Um, and I think it's, it's best appreciated before reading Melancholy Resistance. So hope everybody's doing well. Thank you.